This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Dave McDonald. And we're pretty famous, apparently. <laughs> we are? Yeah. Didn't you didn't you sit haven't you been reading New Music Box? I read New Music Box every day. It must have slipped slipped by me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean these four guys got on the got on their little program. That's what I'm saying. How, how bad am I? Their little program. Their little program. But so anyway, what we were great. trying to say is that New Music Box had an article about our, thanks to Rob Deemer, our, our great friend at New Music Box. Uh, friend of the show. Friend of the show, if you will. The Alec Baldwin of Sound Notion. The what? The Alec Baldwin of Sound Notion. Okay. He's been on more than anybody else. Okay. Anyway, uh, he wrote a Saturday nice piece about us uh, in New Music Box and said some very kind things, perhaps stretching the truth with the kindness, um, and we appreciate that very much. So thank you, Rob. And if you're interested in you know how the show came about and how we put it together every week and what we think about what we're doing, you should check that out over on New Music Box. And of course, we'll have a link to that and everything else uh, in our in our show notes. There's a video. There's a video of us being interviewed by Rob in the style of Sound Notion. Yeah, it's kind of a kind of a bizarro <laughs> Sound Notion experience. So if that yes. sounds as, like something that would appeal to you, you should check it out. As the tweet said, they he turned the tables on us. Indeed. Yes. And we couldn't be happier. As Agent Smith said, "Me, me, me." Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, everyone, get that movie. <laughs> Nothing happened happened in the world of music this week. I, and I don't we don't think. have a guest. And we don't have a guest, so we're I'm I'm hoping for twenty two minutes flat this week. So we're gonna talk about some trashy paperback romances, right? <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. that's if if you've been listening to this show for seventy six episodes and thought to yourself, man, when are they gonna talk about my favorite literature? Today is the day. We talk about Fifty Shades of Grey. That rhymed. Um, so apparently there has been a spike in sales of English Renaissance motets, in particular, Spem in Allium by Thomas Tallis, uh, and apparently this is attributed to the popularity of smutty romance novel, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Is this, <laughs> am I, am I summarizing this correctly? Uh, that, that sounds just about right, Dave. So what's what's the deal? I don't know. I mean, so people. I guess people are so <laughs> captivated with the literary merit of Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, but what is what that, does Fifty Shades of Grey have to do with Talus? I don't know. I, to tell you the truth, I haven't read the book, so I can't tell you. But I, from what, what do you I mean understand, you haven't read the book. This is like <laughs> Harry Potter. Everybody's read the book. <laughs> I haven't read the book, but apparently they. Uh, the author or, or one character is listening to the piece and I guess like get, goes into ex- ecstasy over this over the sound and everybody else in the real world here wants to experience that for themselves so they go out and buy Thomas Dallas. That's pretty, well. This sounds pretty reasonable to me. Yeah. Well, I do like Thomas Dallas too. I gotta say. Me too. Um. Uh. The the, the one one headline was mummy porn. M U M M Y, mummy porn from the UK. Yes, <laughs> mummy porn yields classical hit. Um, Norman, uh, you were saying his Dave name differently than I've I said it before. I don't know how to say it. Lebrecht. Lebrecht. Norman I Lebrecht. I say Lebrecht, uh, but whatever. Well, anyway, we we've uh, been critical of his writing on the show before, uh, but that he said he he puts forth that. Uh, that there's a particularly hot scene in the book wherein this piece is used as the background, which it seems funny that that you know the actual music is being sold because somebody's describing a scene that has the music in it. <coughs> so anyway, it, he seems to take he seems to take umbrage a little bit with the fact that um, people have leveraged this popularity and, and the fact that it comes from a smut novel. He doesn't like the fact that that's increasing sales. Which is ridiculous. It's, I, li- I tell you what, I like that it's increasing sales. Yeah. I mean, it's increasing sales. Yeah. That's all that needs to be said. <laughs> well, I mean, so he he uh, he asked a question on 
uh, Twitter when he linked to this page, and I'm trying to find it. Um, but it was something like, should we use this kind of trash to sell classical music? Is this really the best thing for classical music? Um, and it's a ridiculous question. Right? Yeah. Because it's not as though the fact that this, this is in Fifty Shades of Grey is somehow diminishing Thomas Tallis or the Tallis Scholars or any record label or really anyone at all. Right, it's not effect. This is this is like the argument that uh, anti marriage people use against gay marriage. Like, if, yeah. if the queers get married, then then that's going to ruin my <laughs> straight marriage. Like, yeah. of course it doesn't. That's idiotic. Yeah, and it, 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 dumb people or people who have poor taste in literature discovering Thomas Dallas in this book and buying a copy has absolutely no impact on. The way the you Thomas or I or anyone else in the world listens to Thomas Dallas. Well, right? and that that that's sort of like uh, granting yourself the high, the moral <laughs> high ground because you're talking about classical music and using that as a starting point for your you know discussion of any subject is just a bankrupt way of looking at it. And that's one of the problems that the classical music world, I think, has generally is that they're no longer music with a capital M, you know, they're just <laughs> like the record company that's getting more money because of this. It, it's just a, you know, it's just a product. And if they can leverage that product to get more money, that's what they're going to do. Right. So his, his tweet is, should classical music exploit illiterate smut? Just asking. Uh, like, go away. Go down yeah. the fire. <laughs> yeah. But more importantly, Chloe Veltman was the only person, as Dave pointed out, that had the the, the, uh, the cojones. Balls. We'll go with the balls because it's the a balls. sex story. Had the balls for the sperm. She actually had sperm and allium in her headline. And yes. several people alluded to the possible misspelling of the Talis title, but uh, Chloe Veltman was the only one that went for it. Went went for the jugular on that one. <laughs> yes, um, and she points mixing out. My, uh, go for it. Yeah. Well, she basically points out that using sex to sell is nothing new. The fact that it happens to be channeled through a book that has a sex scene is no different. I mean, we've talked about it on the show many times, and it doesn't bear much more discussion. But, you know, provocatively dressed uh, female violinists selling yet another copy of uh, Four Seasons by wearing a tiny black dress or whatever. Interestingly, so, however... Speaking of hookers... Times Hold on. Square. Hold on, I'm not done. <laughs> Interestingly, the author, E.L. James, has on his own website a soundtrack. And I don't know if these are uh, actual tracks that are mentioned during the, sh the uh, in the mo in, in the movie in the book um, or not. But like "Toxic" by Britney Spears is on there, and one called "Sex on Fire" by Kings of Leon. And several, there's a Via Lobos piece, the, uh, is it Bakinas by a, <laughs> number five for voice and eight cellos. I've seen the piece perform though. Um, anyway, it's pretty interesting that, that, uh, you know, the classical music is not the only thing on there. All your, your typical things that you might expect are also part of that playlist. We should point out also that E.L. James is a she. Oh, is she? Well, it's, it's the nom de plume of, uh, uh, UK author, I don't remember her real name. Oh, like I said, I haven't read it. And did I don't think so, you're gonna. So did we so, hear anybody say Thomas Fallis? No, I didn't. I didn't see any right. Thomas Fallises, but that was okay. a good one too. <laughs> uh, All right, children. enough of that. Moving on. Next story. Uh, so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, Philip Glass was commissioned by NPR Music to write a piece for his own 75th birthday celebration, I suppose. And mm. uh, the the score was published on the web. Anybody could grab it and download it. And then the idea was that a bunch of people would learn a part to this, this choral piece and go down to Times Square this last week and give its premiere uh, in just kind of a flash mob type way uh, in in Times Square. And that happened. It actually happened. And it is is has video documentation. Patrick, you were there, right? 
I was there. But tell first, us, tell us I, about the experience. It was it was a good experience. Let me say that. I like the idea of going to Times Square and there's all these people gathered around to be a part of this project. Um, there was, it, aside from just a glass piece, there was also, I believe, Handel and maybe a few other pieces. Um, and they did like a little rehearsal um, beforehand. Oh, okay. Um, but they started playing uh, the other pieces. So it wasn't just a, a sight read of, of Philip Glass immediately at the end. Okay. Now the, it's the funny obviously thing so was wait. The, what's funny thing was though, when they did perform the piece at the end, um, <laughs> the conductor stopped because there was a I, there, I guess there was a mix up in his beat pattern, and they had to restart the piece again. Huh. So they kind of I mean, they kind of brushed over that a little bit in the uh, in the video yeah, from NPR Music. Yeah, the, the Times Review didn't though. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> um, but it was it was very cool and. And you can tell, like, you know, they, I think the, God, I can't remember. Some of the pieces, you know, if, if you're in choir, I, was, I wasn't really a choir person, but everyone knows these works by, you know, it might have been Handel or something that they played. I can't even remember now. But um, you end up on these big cadential, uh, you know, endings, and everyone's like, oh, I know how to sing again. And then they sing the Philip Glass piece, and it's, like, so quiet. Everyone's hedging their bet on every note they're singing. Yeah. Yeah. It I was, mean, go ahead. It was obvious that some people rehearsed at home because, you know, at uh, in the video that NPR's got, it's a really well produced video. They focus in on a lot of different people and you can, you know, they're, they're doing it. Um, and I think this is a wonderful um, idea to have a piece that's executed this way. So kudos to NPR for coming up with the idea. The Philip Glass piece is unbelievably terrible, however. Yeah, it's not not my favorite Philip Glass piece, and I'm I, I should even be that much of a judge because I don't not really wild about most Philip Glass's music. Um, <laughs> but it just feel like it's been Philip Glass's seventy fifth birthday for a couple of years now. Yeah, it does a little bit. Um, but so he didn't even show up to this. No. There's a thing at the end of the video where they're like, "Oh, let's give Philip Glass a hand," and they you don't know, like he's not there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we should watch this video. Actually, this is one of uh, NPR's NPR Music's field recordings uh, series of videos. We, we I think a long time ago we showed, I guess, so percussion or some, not so percussion, some other percussion group performing uh, in a hardware store using things that are sold in the hardware store. Um, right. This is so- a, a really interesting series they have of of performances in non traditional performance spaces so here's just a hey hey one, one second so I, I want to put forth the idea i'm not sure if we're going to get to see this person but i think philip glass was there in hiding when you see the person with the the pink flowery shirt on with the backpack and a hat and glasses tell me if that doesn't look like philip glass okay we'll look for it <laughs> just watch a little loud it gets quieter. The street noise is very loud at the beginning of the recording.
that's the premiere. And, and like Sam said, it's a fantastic idea. I love the idea of, of writing a piece for um, everybody to participate in. And how cool is it for somebody in New York to get to be a part of a premiere of a new work by Philip Glass? I think that's pretty cool. Um, you guys but you weren't a fan. Closing thoughts? No, I, but you know what? I, I'm not a fan, but if, if I lived in the area, I would absolutely have gone down and learned a part and sang it. <laughs> absolutely. Did you and also so, so like, you so you went, Patrick, you didn't uh you didn't, I didn't sing? I didn't sing. I, I went with a um a coworker of mine who I looked did, for you in the video. I'd probably be in, where the screen cap is when you first start the video to the right somewhere. Okay. But uh you'll look for me later. But um I did go with a coworker of mine who did sing in the choir and she she enjo- she really enjoyed it. What did she think uh, of the music? Well, she had printed it out and and did rehearse it. Um and I I, I don't I think she liked it all right. I didn't I mean, she liked participating in it, I think yeah. more. The idea of being a part of, of something. It's certainly like that. fun to do. Yeah. Certainly fun to do. So, I mean, I I think we should have more of these kind of uh, this is kind of along the lines, I guess, of the. Do you remember the, the subway, uh, thing the knights did? What was it like? All, cello suites. Oh, the this was the. This is a James Holt project. James mm-hmm. Holt. Sorry. Yeah. Um, friend of the show. Yeah, I wasn't on for that episode. I forget what it was called, but yeah. But um, I think we should just do more things like this. Sure. You know. Sure. No matter no matter if it's if it's music you like or music you don't like. You know, well, so that thing was that? was a performance in non traditional spaces for people that weren't expecting it. But I really like what I, one of the things, probably the thing that I like most about this is that everybody was invited to perform, which is a cool thing. Um, speaking of being invited to perform, you all and we all are, have been invited to participate in Alarm Will Sounds uh, performance of the Cage Songbooks or several performances of the Cage Songbooks over the last few months. Uh, Sam, have you participated in any of these? I just submitted text via Twitter. Yeah, I have too. Um, and I don't know if any of that text has showed up in any of the performances. Um, I want to be clear that I don't know exactly what they're doing because I haven't gone through the process of submitting content for the newest one. Um, but, um, you can go and you have to create a Google Plus account and then, do these different things, and I haven't gone through it, but... Uh, if you have a Google account, you have a Google Plus account. Right. So Alarm Will Sound, they're in the last performance um, of this for their what their current cycle is tonight, so it's too late. By the time you see this show, it'll be too late. But the performance is happening tonight at the, what is it, River to River Festival? Is yes. that what it's called? Yeah. And uh, there's actually a YouTube video that kind of, I don't know if they're like using this as a way to get material that they're going to use in the performance. On Alarm Will Sound's webpage right now, there's a YouTube video uh, embedded that shows them talking about the project and an earlier performance they did during in April of the piece. And it's a big multimedia extravaganza with all manner of stage pieces and microphones amplifying uh, everyday objects and this kind of thing. So it's a, a big multimedia production, and uh, people have been submitting content, we think, via Google Hangout and recording it. Dave, can you play, uh, it, it, just to show people why I'm sort of confused as what's going on, play a little bit of that Google Hangout video. Yeah, if you, if you understand what's going on in this video, <laughs> let us know. Yeah. <laughs> Notice Alan Pearson eating spaghetti, or I don't know if he's eating spaghetti right now. And wearing a hat. Yeah. So check out Alan Pearson with the hat now, like taking the hat on and off. And like, somewhat, where's the spaghetti? The spaghetti is just totally awkward. Oh, they told me to go right away. <laughs> so. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, if you understand what's going on in this, and I understand if you don't understand what's going on with the Cage Songbooks in general, really, who does? Um, but 
if you understand what this video is, we would love an explanation. That's our that's our our question to you this week. We should do that. We should ha solicit some response every week. Yeah, that's well, it I for the week. I guarantee you that that video makes me interested in the performance, and I can't wait until Indeed. some some videos of those performances are posted. Alarm will sound. We're talking to you. So were you in the Google Hangout? No, you, that's you just drop a, in. I don't know. You have to go through a process where you sign up and everything, and they schedule. Um, like on their YouTube channel that they have right now, there is that that video we just watched, and a uh, the John Cage Songbook Solo sixty one um, live stream, which I assume is the thing that's happening tonight, although it's not incredibly clear. It's, <laughs> if you click on the link, it says it's going to start in a few minutes. Please wait. Maybe but it's going to start in a few minutes. Well, it's been saying that since about six thirty this morning. Oh. But maybe that that's just what it's saying because it's going to happen tonight. So not really sure what the deal is with that, but I'm going to check it tonight. Maybe that's just a cage thing. Man. <laughs> well, I, I can cage guarantee you. Cage instructed you to put on your live stream to the internet. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it will be starting momentarily for hey, 24 if, hours. If there's somebody who would. Well, uh, it's interesting. One of the things they point out in this little video, like an informational video about the project, um is uh, that if Cage were alive, he would be into using mobile devices and using this kind of technology. And I completely I agree. agree. Totally completely agree. agree. He like, wouldn't, and he wouldn't be burdened by the need to have some sort of, uh, you know, advanced technological understanding of it. He would just figure out how to make use of it in some really cool way. Patrick, were you going to say something? What, I was going to say, when did he, was it like 1992 or 95? When did he die? Mm, 92, I think. Something like that. Pre, uh, Around the time of the graphical web. Yes. So this is way before video. Before. So, um, I don't know how to segue into this one, so let's just go there. Um, you want to go to Bandcamp? <laughs> Nobody say it. No. Oh, it's so hard. Uh, so, so uh, hard. There's, the, the Baltimore Symphony has invited grown-up <laughs> to band camp. What? It's just, just the grown up is a funny word. Go on. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, grown up. the Baltimore <laughs> Symphony Orchestra. Had, there's a big thing this week. Uh, this got a lot of publicity, but it's a cool project, so it probably deserves them. Uh, the Baltimore Symphony invited a bunch of adults to participate in the equivalent of band camp. Uh, they got a bunch of people who play instruments to pay the money and come in and sit in with the orchestra and do orchestra rehearsals, uh, get coaching sessions, get lessons, play in chamber ensembles, uh, all the things that uh, you, you get to do in band camp when you're in junior high and high school, uh, these guys are doing as adults. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of these people have only picked up instruments in uh, their adulthood, which is a cool trend. I, I love seeing this. Um, and it's a very cool project by the Baltimore Symphony. It's framed a little bit like uh, the the price is mentioned a couple of times. Um, well, it's seventeen fifty, I think, or something in that neighborhood is what it was to attend. But then there's a little in one of the paragraphs it just says with add-ons for chamber music coaching and apparently like there's all kinds of different activities, lessons, lodging, etc. Three three thousand dollars is not out of the question for the whole experience. But like for what you're getting, I think that's yeah. totally reasonable. And this is like it's a week, right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's a week. Yeah, and they point out in the article, I'm talking about an article from the New York Times, um, we'll have a link to, uh, points out that other uh, orchestras have done this, but it's more like weekend master classy kind of thing, not a full-on go-stay-there intensive, you know, boot camp style training, which, you know, uh, I think this is good. Having dealt with adult students as a <laughs> instrument teacher, have you guys done this before? Have, have an adult student... I don't that's think new so. to the instrument. It's strange. It's it's a it's a it's a strange experience because, you know, they have they're just not as malleable in a lot of ways as a little kid would be, and they don't have any idea what the practice time involved really is. You know, when by the time you you're do little kids, but yeah, but they have the time. They just don't think they do. 
But like a, a grown up quote, you know, if they get a job and family and this and that and the other, you know, finding time to really put some some hardcore practice time in can be tough. And I think um, this is a cool project, not just for the the people that are participating to get to learn the instruments. It's a cool project for them uh, and the orchestra to really get to know each other and build their community in in a really interesting way. Um, absolutely. And this is it does uh, a lot of the things that we always talk about social media being good for, but this is obviously much more effective because they're spending real time with these people in front of their instruments and. Um, you know, the, the, in the article, he talks about getting to really know the individuals that are a part of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, which is an amazing thing. Uh, I would love to get to know the individuals that are a part of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, you know? no kidding. Um, so this is a, a very cool project, uh, and, and I hope that it's the kind of thing that catches on. And it's the kind of thing that you can do without being the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, Right, this is the kind of thing that can happen and be very effective in regional orchestras and in, in, in the sorts of smaller orchestras, smaller budget orchestras <coughs> that we talked about last week with Drew McManus. Um, Certainly this is not a very the cool project. The Certainly Lansing three thousand dollars. The Lansing Symphony is a, you know pretty capable, uh, but not a big orchestra. But I couldn't imagine they couldn't do this kind of thing around here because there are are multiple, just from working at the shop, I know that there are multiple community bands in the area that have enough people signing up to play for free to fill out a full concert band. And not just one, but multiple of those around the area regionally, you know, like in a 50-mile radius from Lansing. And Grand Rapids Symphony, too. Yeah, so I think smaller symphonies, this would be, in a way, it seems like it'd be even better for them to do it. Um, you know, well, it's but, like somewhere between the small, small community orchestras and the larger orchestras, like something with, with regional, with large regional presence, this would be great for. Mm-hmm. The one thing I, I would say is I hope that they, uh, like Dave, you said that social media is a cool way to get together, but this is even better. And I agree, but I hope they figure out a way to leverage some new media strategies to, You know, make sure people know about this and sort of have the people. What I would really like to see is the people who did it sharing their experiences in a way that would make it easier, make it easy for people to get a hold of that information and sort of, you know, get it from their point of view. And and also maintain this community that they're building after the event is over. Right. right? Um, I wonder what the average age of the participants was. I don't know. Mm hmm. Uh, should we move into uh, Woody Guthrie, Sam? Yes, Woody Guthrie. Uh, you've, there have been stories uh, all over, uh, you know, radio and probably TV. Um, it's the centennial of Woody Guthrie's birth. It was yesterday, I think it was. Um, so there have been a lot of stories going around. It's just worth mentioning because he's sort of, uh, you know, an important figure if, if you're talking about uh, American music and uh, and a lot of people's approach to the, a way of thinking about music and performance style and sort of, uh, I don't know what to say, you know, but so, so goes Woody Guthrie. There, there you have Bob Dylan and Bob Dylan is certainly an influential feature, uh, figure in American popular music scene. And, you know, he traces directly back to Woody Guthrie, just as an example. Um, an interesting thing that I knew a little bit about, and I actually looked up a little bit this morning, is um, we talk about copyright a lot on the show and how you know it's gotten to the point where um, for something to be in the, uh, in the uh, public domain, it's got to be 5,000 years old. Um, <laughs> this Land is Your Land, that's the sort of the title track that everybody knows from Woody Guthrie, right? Um, there was a... Uh, copyright dispute over that where a company um ludlow uh publishers trying to claim copyright on it in 1984 but it was 11 years too late so because it was written when it was written and it was under the laws during which it was written the copyright expired in 28 years (laughs) off of that uh piece and uh, so it was released to the public domain, and 
this company wanted to claim copyright just because, like we were talking about other, earlier, they see this product and, like, look how popular it is and how embedded in culture it is. If we can get our hooks into that thing, we can really make some money. Um, but I read a quote earlier. Guth, uh, he himself said that he didn't want uh, copyright. He wanted people to sing it and use it and disperse it and remix it, although he didn't use that word, rework it any way they wanted. It was his gift to humanity. There's uh, there's this great quote by Woody Guthrie about copyright, actually. One of my favorite authors who releases a lot of his works under Creative Commons license uh, includes this quote at the beginning of a lot of them. He, he writes, as Woody Guthrie once said, This song is copyrighted in the U.S. under seal of copyright number 154085 for a period of 28 years, and anybody caught singing it without our permission will be, a mighty, will be mighty good friends of iron because we don't give a darn. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing it. Yodel it. We wrote it. That's all we wanted to do. That's the quote I was talking so about. Actually, it's, it's yeah, a, it's a great quote. Yeah. So we'll we'll leave that one there and move on to Sam. Our uh, the pick of the week. I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a fail. That was so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, you're such a failure. I know it's tough when we've only got three panelists because you know. <laughs> It's you like, gotta oh, move, what? move, move. We got, we got three just... panelists, no guests, and no news. Was... So no place to hide. No place. When are we yes. gonna get? When are we gonna get that soundboard, Dave? Uh, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> we need it. No, we we <laughs> definitely need to not ever get it. Um, so... The pick of the week this week is speaking of alarm will sound at the 2010 Mizzou New Music Summer Festival. Uh, alma mater of our uh, lead panelist, Dave McDonald. <laughs> yeah. Paul Dooley's Point Blank, as performed by uh, Alarm Will Sound, not available for as a commercial recording yet. However, interestingly, uh, we're going to have a link to his website, and it's available. You can look at the score, which I always think is pretty interesting, and it has rental information. So it's a pick of the week where no audio, but if you want to perform it, there it is. Indeed. So here it is, Point Blank, Paul Dooley. Kicks in with the the That's drum proven. set and and pit, pizzicato strings. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I like it. So anyway. I like the. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big bass trombone fan. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> some some rock and trombone. Any, going on. any raunchy bass trombone like gets Patrick's vote. <laughs> That's what I, I call bass raunchy trombone. bass trombone, yeah. where it's like oh. just loud and blah. blah. <laughs> like Lost. There you right, go. Exactly. <laughs> That's like and, Michael G- Giacchino. Yeah, thing. Michael Giacchino. He's a lost composer. Anyway, not a lost composer, but the composer for... <laughs> never mind. Hey, if you really want to get Dave's uh, Dave going on something, always bring up the theme to the new Star Trek movie. What? Yes. G- oh, I, I, yeah. The new Star Trek movie has a terrible theme. Song. That's not the point of the show. You're just trying it, to make me angry. <laughs> this Paul Dooley piece... Want- just despite the Michael Giacchino similarity is really excellent. Um, the the squeal. I, I, so the you mentioned the 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 raunchy bass trombone, or maybe I made up the word raunchy bass trombone. But the combination of that with the squeaky squealy clarinets is really really cool. Uh, and and there's a lot of empty space in between, and a lot of composers don't like that. But I think it's kind of neat to have that that big space in between them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so should we, Sam? Do you have anything you want to add? 
Nope. Okay. <laughs> you were looking like you had something to say. Uh, I'm looking at the score. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. I got to say, I just like the piece. Cool stuff. Check it out on Paul Dooley's website. We'll have the link on our site in the show notes. That, along with everything else, is going to be on our site, soundnotion.tv slash sn, where you can also leave a note. Um, if you, you can also, of course, always listen to this show live on Sunday mornings around 11 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, and you can do that at soundnotion.tv slash live. Um, you can also connect with us to share your thoughts after the show is over, um, and you can do that on our site. You can also do that on Facebook and Twitter, where we're at Sound Notion. This show and all our shows are available on the iTunes Store, so be sure to go there, subscribe for free, download every episode to your device automatically, uh, and catch every episode. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you back next week. Bye-bye.